Well, good morning. We are glad that you continue to join KMCC through the online service, and, and we trust that the messages are beneficial to you and to your family. Uh, as we study through the history of the early church, as recorded in the book of Acts, we are reminded through the narrative of how the early church grew and how it thrived. And three things that spurred their growth were corporate worship, fellowship with other believers, and generosity. And if you consider KMCC to be your home church, I would encourage you to please consider how you can more fully enter into these bases of Christian uh, fellowship. First of all, worship by reading your Bible and praying daily and continue to join us for these online worship services each and every week. Number two, fellowship with other believers by emailing or texting or calling the staff and elders or even some friends here at KMCC. We would love to hear from you and to pray for you. And lastly, practice generosity by giving financially to the ministry of KMCC. Your financial gifts make it possible for us to continue to give this offering to you on a weekly basis. So please know that we continue to pray for you all. And uh, as you watch us online, if you have benefited from the services, we would encourage you to please pass along the word to your friends and family so they can join us as well. Be encouraged in the goodness of our God. All right, I'm going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter... 16 verse 25 that's where we're at this morning i'm gonna have ruth my daughter-in-law come on up and read for us x 16 25 through 40 about midnight paul and silas were praying and singing hymns to god and the prisoners were listening to them and suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and with trembling with fear he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And they took him the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Therefore come out now and go in peace. Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No! Let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these things to the magistrates, and when they were afraid, when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Thank you. You guys all got, got it. I forgot to tell you to stand up, so thank you. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, Ruth, for reading. Good story. This is like a typical like Sunday school story, right? Well, today our theme is Rejoice in Jesus in All Circumstances, and we looked at the beginning of this story of Paul and Silas last week. It's another story where Jesus' witnesses were thrown into prison for simply witnessing about Jesus and proclaiming that Jesus is the way of salvation. And these two men had done nothing wrong. We saw this. They'd done nothing wrong. They were, they were actually doing good. They were offering salvation to lost people. They were exercising demons out of those in bondage. And, and yet these men of God were treated shamefully. They were falsely accused. They were dragged by their armpits and into the marketplace. And they were flogged repeatedly, yelled at, screamed at, ridiculed, thrown in a dungeon, hands and feet in the shackles, blood dripping down their backs, heads screaming with pain, I'm sure, bruises all over their body, hungry, thirsty, and just plain miserable. And there they sit there in the dark with after all that trauma, all that humiliation, all that pain, all that injustice, and all that frustration, and that's where we left them last week. Remember, we kind of left the cliffhanger. We left them sitting in prison. And I'm sure they had a difficult time sleeping that night. Sore and bruised as they were, I'm sure that every movement was excruciating. And I've learned that when you get over 30, sleeping on a cold, hard rock floor is nearly impossible, right? You guys tracking with me? Some of you are. Um, 
at least not without an air mattress. Uh, they did not sleep. There was no air mattress. The cell was not sanitary, so lying down on the floor, which most likely was used as a latrine, would not have been the best idea anyway with their open wounds. And so long after it got dark, these two brothers in Christ are sitting there in the pitch black, leaning up against that stone wall, gingerly caring for their limbs, legs cramping from being in those shackles and stocks. And I can imagine Silas begins to pray, right? And he pours his heart out to God. And then Paul is reminded of some old Israelite hymns from the Psalms, and he begins to sing. And perhaps he began to sing, we don't know, but perhaps he began to sing something like Psalm chapter 56. Listen as I, as I read Psalm chapter 56. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise, in the Lord, whose word I praise, I trust. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. I think of Paul in that prison singing a psalm like that. He knew these psalms. He was a Pharisee, so he knew these by heart. These were songs that the Israelites had sang. And, and maybe he sung now Psalm 142. Listen to this one. With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see there's none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains for me. No one cares for my soul. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they're too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. And you can picture him kind of singing those songs, right? And, and Luke records that at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God while the prisoners were listening. Verse 25 of Acts 16, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Now we've got to stop here for a minute, okay? Paul and Silas were praying and singing. What did they do in response to the persecution, to the trauma, to the humiliation, to the betrayal, to the false accusations of racism, to pain and misfortune, to injustice, to losing all they had and the bruising and the beatings, all of that stuff? They turned to God. They responded by praying and singing hymns to God. Because they were human, I'm sure they felt some of the same things that we feel, right? Remember what had happened to them. The crowd had attacked them with accusations of racism on their lips. Remember they had said, these men are Jews and they are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to follow or accept. And then the crowd acted unjustly. They attacked them just to make a statement. And the leaders then tore their garments off of them. And then the, so they, they re emotionally reacted to the situation. And then the magistrates gave orders to have them beaten with rods. And they were severely. They inflicted many blows upon them, what, is what the scripture says. And then the ones who had done no wrong, the ones who were innocent of any of those charges, were thrown into prison. While the ones who were actually guilty of extortion and profiteering and racism and slavery and rioting were free to continue to do what they were doing all along. And to make matters worse, the injustice was perpetrated because the jailer was ordered to put them into prison and to fasten them into stocks and ensure that they could not escape from the situation. And when we sit with Paul and Silas and put ourselves in their shoes, it's not fair, right? And, and do you feel this, like, angst inside of you, right? And when we read this story within the context of what's been going on in, uh, in the past year and a half in our own society, things like pastors being fined and imprisoned for having their churches open or pastors being, uh, or, or individuals losing their jobs for convictions that they have or terrorist groups hunting down Christians and killing them, what do you feel inside? 
And as I mentioned last week, I, to be honest, feel the fleshly side of me feels anger and frustration and grief and a desire for vengeance, right? That's what our flesh wants is vengeance. And here's what spoke to me, and I I believe what what God wants me to tell you from this passage. It's that Paul and Silas did not act on those feelings. Instead, they took those feelings and those desires and those fears and those thoughts straight to God in prayer. And to quote Apostle Peter, they humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he would exalt them. They cast all their cares on him because they knew he cared for them. They cast their burdens upon Jesus because they knew that Jesus cared for them. They truly believed that what man meant for evil, God would always turn for good. And this gave them great joy. As they cast their burden on Jesus in the midst of the pain and the agony, the storm of persecution, trusting in the goodness and the sovereignty of God, Jesus lifted their spirits so that they sang songs reminding them of his salvation through Jesus. They sang hymns of how Jesus himself suffered, how he, just like them, had been through abuse and beating and mockery and justice and ridicule and murder and all of that for us. Never once did Jesus retaliate or take vengeance upon his enemies. In fact, he prayed, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And brothers and sisters, when we look at what's going on in the world around us, When we watch our fellow brothers and sisters go through incredible injustices, when evil seems to triumph, when our source of income is on the line, when terrorists are running free and taking over countries, when we lose our jobs because we're Christians or we get censored because we speak about Jesus or when we're lied about because we speak the truth of the gospel or when we're shunned by family and friends because they don't like our lifestyle and it makes them feel uncomfortable, when all that happens and we're stuck in a proverbial prison cell, unable to move and unable to do anything about all of that, what will we do? When our flesh wants vengeance and justice and fairness, how will we act? And I think that we have quite a bit to learn from the example of Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas in that prison cell in the middle of the night with no way of changing their circumstances and no way out of the death sentence that was in front of them, they prayed to Jesus and sang joyful praises to God. Can you imagine Those guys had no idea what the future held. They did not know what God was going to do next. They most likely thought this was the end of the road for them. But they praised Jesus anyway. They didn't let the injustice or the violence or the racism or any of that stuff take their eyes off of Jesus. They rejoiced in God because they had salvation. And this is what makes us Christians different than the world. We have hope because we know that God will turn it all for good. And in this, we can rejoice and be glad. You know, the past few chapters of Acts, we've read two accounts of Peter, who was also thrown into prison, just like Paul and Silas. And God released him from prison twice. During, uh, but during the, uh, the trial, sitting in those dungeon cells, Peter, 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 sorry, Peter did not know that God was going to release him both of those times. In fact, one of those times, he was so asleep that an angel had to come and you know, kind of wake him up and hit him on the side to get him going. And with his imprisonments and suffering in mind, Peter wrote a letter to members of a church who were suffering intense persecution just like he had. And please listen to what Peter wrote in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 15. He said, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. In other words, we can rejoice in Jesus in all circumstances because he's got our souls in the palm of his hands and he's not going to let us go. We trust that the faithful creator has saved us and that nothing happens, that happens to us will separate us from his love. His love continues. And when we know all that, when we truly believe in our innermost being in our souls and not just in our heads, but when this truth becomes reality for us, we can then rejoice in Jesus in all circumstances. And here's what we can learn from Paul and Silas. I feel like God's given us this passage for a reason. He's preparing our hearts uh, for what is ahead. Not so that we fear, but so that we are completely, have complete faith in him. And so that we know how to respond in tough situations. And Paul and Silas did not allow their circumstances to get them down. 
They did not allow the false accusations or the lies or the unjust beatings or whatever was going out around them or the cold, dark, damp floor or the prolonged, painful shackles dictate their attitudes. Paul and Silas did not seek revenge for the wrongful way that they were treated. They allowed the truth of the gospel to dictate their attitudes in the worst of circumstances. They allowed the sovereignty and the love and the grace of God to lift them above what was going on and give them joy. They allowed the truth of God's word, the blessing of life and forgiveness, the warmth of brotherly love, the hope of eternal, pain-free, heavenly existence and blessings to influence how they responded to their not-so-good circumstances. And it's no coincidence that when Paul wrote his letter to the Philippian church, he keyed in on this concept of joy and rejoicing. And his whole letter to the Philippians um, can be summed up in one word, joy. And yet Paul wrote the letter from guess where? Another prison cell. Another prison cell yet again. And while he's in prison, he thought of the Philippians, the ones who are in this story, and he wrote something. And that whole church knew what Paul, happened to Paul and Silas, and this, was, this story was famous. Everyone knew this prison break story. But it wasn't just because God rescued them, but because of what happened to the jailer and to his family and to all those people who put their faith in Jesus. And here's what Paul says about being a disciple of Jesus amid not-so-good circumstances. All right? When I read this passage from, from Philippians, consider the circumstances that were in Paul's mind as he wrote this letter to the Philippians. All right? He had just been in prison. He's still in prison. And he lived through all of this stuff. And listen to Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. He starts out with rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Think of him in that prison cell. He lived this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything worthy of excellence or praise, think about these things. And what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, Paul says, practice these things. So what you've seen me go through in this prison cells of life, practice these same things and the God of peace will be with you. He said, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have received, you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low in prison I know how to abound. In every and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty, hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, this context for the verse that's so often taken out of context, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, right? We see that poster plastered everywhere, right? Is this situation. What are the all things that he's referring to? Well, rejoicing in the midst of pain, praying in the midst of uncertainty, being at peace in the midst of violence and unrest, allowing God to take vengeance in his time and in his way, being content with nothing, thinking upon the truth and love of Jesus in the midst of hate and trauma, giving thanks when everything is taken away. In short, living like Jesus. We can do all things in the way in which Jesus did through him, the Holy Spirit, who gives us the strength to do it. The question is, will we allow these truths to overshadow the pain and these truths to determine our response? Will we walk in the Spirit, producing His fruit in the face of difficulty? One more thing uh, to learn from this verse, verse 25, is it says that the prisoners were listening to them. You know, when we as Christians go through the trials of life, people are watching us and they are listening to us. And the question is, what are they hearing? Is it grumbling and complaining and ranting and raving? It's not any different from what they would do. Is it worrying and distressing or fretting or despairing? Again, not any different than what the world does and how they would respond. Is it planning and scheming and preparing and conspiring? 
This is what most prisoners spend their time doing, right? Trying to get out of the situation that they're in. Never works, by the way. Jesus is the only means of salvation. Or are we trusting and praying and praising and thanking? The reason that people grumble and complain and they rant and they rave and they worry and they fret and they plan and they scheme and they conspire is because they want to manipulate the circumstances so that they can be happy and peaceful and comfortable and safe. But circumstances are not what make us happy and peaceful and safe. We've seen plenty of people that have those mansions. They work the job that they want, marry the women of their dreams, and they sit on their back verandas and they'll overlook everything that's theirs. But inside, they're still feeling unhappy. They're still in turmoil, right? They're not happy, peaceful, or thankful. And yet Paul and Silas were while in prison. Why? Because circumstances never guarantee joy and peace. Only Jesus can. And only Jesus can give us true joy and peace and contentment resulting in thanksgiving and praise to God. The key is trusting in him, that he has us in the palm of his hands, that his love will never run out. We cast our burdens on him because only he can do anything about it and we pray to him in love, content with the fact that we are his. And when a watching and listening world hears us pray and praise in the prison cells of life after enduring the evils of the world, they see Jesus through us. Grumbling and complaining doesn't convict hearts. Worrying and fretting doesn't grab attention. Planning and scheming doesn't point anyone to Jesus. But praying and praising, though, this convicts hearts that they're missing something, that they're missing something. It will grab their attention and point them to the only way of salvation, and that's Jesus. As we rest in Jesus' love and grace, praying and praising, God will work to bring salvation to lost prisoners who are listening and watching. And in this story, that was the prison guard himself. Let's look at verse 26. Verse 26 says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling in fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know, sometimes when God answers our prayers, his power is altogether unnerving, right? Um, if I were sitting there with my arms and legs and, and whatnot chained to the wall and the other prisoners and this building started to shake down to its foundations, I think I would have been a bit glad but a little bit concerned as well. And you've ever been in an earthquake, anyone? Yeah, a couple of you have. I've been in an earthquake. There, it's one of the most unsettling experiences that you can imagine because the ground, which is actually supposed to be stable, is doing what? It's undulating, right? It's going up and down, and you don't know which way it's going to pitch next, and you're at the mercy of every tremor. And so when God came to rescue Paul and Silas, he touched the foundations of this prison, and they were shaken to their core. And God had made a way out. God provided the means of salvation. And I've watched those prison escape movies, right? Prison escapes do not happen by accident. All of them require an escape plan, a plan of salvation. But that plan is never hatched by the person inside. It's hatched by the people outside of the prison. The person in shackles wants to be saved, but that person is unable to save himself. He is not in any position to create a plan of salvation. He's completely at the mercy of his captors. The person on the outside is the one who determines what the plan of salvation is. The person on the outside is the one who executes the plan. The person on the outside is the one who does the saving. And this is what God does, both here and in our lives. He is the source of salvation. He's the one who makes a way out of our sin and death and our bondage to Satan. He determined a plan of salvation, belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he executed the plan. He sent his son, Jesus, to die in our place. And then he's the one who saves. When we place our faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God forgives us and he saves us. 
Salvation is a work from, of God from start to finish. And the jailer experienced this unnerving power of God in the earthquake, his salvation power, and he saw the salvation of God in the fact that the shackles and chains were loosed on the floor, and he heard the praises and the prayers of Paul and Silas, and he saw the mercy and compassion of God in Paul's declaration that all the prisoners were still there, and he wanted in, like, in fear because of all that he saw and felt and heard and experienced, and he fell down before Paul and Silas and said, what must I do to receive all this, to be saved? Was he asking to be saved from the imminent execution of the by the authorities because of this prison breach? Or was he asking to be saved from the powerful God who could shake the foundations of a prisoner and release shackles? Or was he asking to be saved from the bondage to his false gods and the emperor cult that enslaved him? Or was he asking to be to, uh, how he could obtain peace and joy and contentment like Paul and Silas had in that bad situation? Or was he asking to be saved from guilt and sin and unworthiness before an all-powerful God? Well, my opinion is he was asking to be saved from all of the above. He was completely undone. He was at his wit's end, and he had seen something amazing. He'd heard something unique. He knew that he was unworthy and that he was in the wrong on many levels. And his question assumes two things. One, and we've said it before, that he repented. He knew that what he was doing and what he was believing in and the direction that he was headed was wrong. And in his heart was open to receiving the truth because he repented. He changed his mind concerning what he had been doing and he believed in something different. He believed that Paul and Silas had the answer and he was willing to accept whatever answer they gave him. And so he said, what must I do to be saved? And I love their answer, right? Simple. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your house. And notice Paul's complete disregard, though, for himself. I want to take us here a second. He had, no, he had no regard for his rights or his freedom, even. He didn't escape, even though he could have. He decided to stay in the prison and allow God to work through this situation. And because Paul was content with his situation, rejoicing in God's plan for him, he had already forgiven the jailer in his heart. And he looked... Uh, at his op at this is an opportunity to share salvation and hope of Jesus with one of his persecutors, one of his enemies. And Paul wrote about this in his letter to the Roman church. Romans chapter 12, verse 19 says, Paul says this, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, he continues, If the enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Paul did not say, nope, you're my enemy. You treated me wrongfully. You threw me in here without even knowing uh, what I did. You bullied me. You censored me. You persecuted me. You, you beat me. I'm done with you. No, Paul immediately pointed the man to the source of salvation, Jesus. And Paul left the vengeance up to God. He fed this man's hungry spirit. He quenched his thirsty soul, and he overcame evil with good. And Paul's words are not just words. They're not just good maxims that we recite so that we sound wise and sophisticated. They're not just words to be put up on a sign and hung up in our kitchen. They're not, they don't just apply when things are going well. They're not just good Christian theory and good Christian doctrine. They are words of life. They are words of truth. And when we are wrongfully treated, bullied, yelled at, neglected, betrayed because we believe in Jesus, will we leave the vengeance up to God? When we're fired from our job or pushed out of the school, will we leave vengeance up to God? This is where the rubber meets the road. And this is when we find out if we truly believe that what God says is true or not. These are the circumstances that prove our faith in Jesus, that he's got it in control. Will we overcome evil with good? And here's the reality. Jesus, Paul, Paul stressed the point. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. So Jesus is Lord. He is the master. He is the authority. He's the decision maker. He is the ruler. He's the emperor. He is the Lord to whom all are accountable. Because ultimately, we have to remember this, we're not accountable to anybody else. We're not accountable to our bosses or our governors or our police officers or senators or presidents or school teachers or anybody else. All human beings, no matter who we are, how low or how high on the totem pole we find ourselves, we give account to one person, and that's Jesus. 
We're accountable to the Lord Jesus before him that we all bow. He is the one who determines our fate. And he says, believe in the Lord Jesus, the one who controls everything, and you will be saved. Salvation is offered by God to everyone, good people, bad people, thieves and hard workers, God-fearers and demon-possessed, politicians and factory workers, jailers and convicts. The invitation is open to everyone. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And if you've not placed your faith in Jesus for salvation, for your sins, please do so today. And then I encourage you, come and tell me or anyone else in this room, make it known just like the jailer did. Look at what he did. This is our third point. The jailer and his family believed. Verse 33. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, and he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in Jesus. So Paul and Silas, they, Silas, they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all his house, and they shared the gospel of Jesus with this man and his family, and they proclaimed that Jesus is the only means of salvation, and the family believed, all of them. And how do we know that they believed? Well, there were immediate and, and genuine evidence uh, of their belief. He, he spoke of his belief in verse 34. He rejoiced in his and their belief, verse 34. He was baptized, he and his whole family, verse 33. And he demonstrated hospitality. He and his family took these prisoners and washed their wounds, welcomed them into their home with food, verse 33 and 34. And he and his family were excited about Jesus, their Savior. They were unashamed about their decision. And sometimes we in the West, we make religion our, and our belief in Jesus a, a very private thing, right? That's my thing. We hesitate to talk about him. We postpone being baptized. We're not careful to offend, or we're careful not to offend. But, but perhaps we could learn something from this jailer who was surrounded by intimidating Roman soldiers and guards coming out of a life of polytheism and emperor worship, but he was unashamed and rejoiced that he had believed in Jesus. You see, truth be told, the unsaved want what we have. They want that peace and that joy and that contentment and that happiness. The problem is they search for it in all the wrong places. But when the unsaved see genuine joy and peace in our lives, as we go through the exact same things that they go through, they want to know who this Jesus is. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and do what? Give glory to God, your Father who is in heaven. Now we get to the aftermath, point four. Verse 35, when it was day, the magistrates sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go, therefore come out and go in peace. And Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. And the police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So in the morning, the magistrates must have changed their minds concerning uh, the severity of Paul and Silas's crimes because they sent the, to the prisoners to let them go. And the, and the jailer receives the order and reports this to Paul and Silas and he says, hey, they're, they're ready to let you go. Go in peace. What a wonderful ending to the story, Right? They could all go in peace and it's all done. But Paul does something very uncharacteristic of him, unexpected. He now brings to light the fact that he and Silas are Roman citizens, right? Paul reveals that he's a citizen of Rome. Now, the question is, why now? Why didn't he do it at the beginning before all the flogging and the beating, right? Why mention it when it's all said and done? Why not play the card at the beginnings to save yourself from all that pain and turmoil and all that trauma and all that beating. Was Paul a glutton for punishment? Here's what I think is going on. Paul could have revealed his Roman citizenship at this late point in the game to give himself another opportunity to present the power of the gospel and the gracious love of God to yet another group of people. You see, it was against Roman law for an official to beat and imprison a Roman citizen without a trial. And this was why these magistrates heard the news and were so afraid. They could, not, they could have lo lost their jobs and been beaten in prison themselves for not looking into the matter more thoroughly. But Paul demonstrated great grace and great restraint. 
He could have demanded his rights. He could have taken vengeance upon the magistrates. He could have brought justice down upon them, and it would have been his right to do so. But Paul demonstrated grace. He demonstrated a different way, the gracious way of Jesus. He, he forgave them. He gave them undeserved grace and love of Jesus. He forgave them. He let them go. They retained their jobs. They did not suffer the consequences of a bad decision. Paul loved them as Jesus loved them. And Luke doesn't tell, them what, tell us whether they believed in Jesus or not, but that isn't the point of the passage. Luke is showing us, through Paul's example, how we are to act as believers regardless of the outcome. The only thing that Paul demanded was that these magistrates acknowledge their wrong and apologetically release them themselves. And I think that Paul demanded that they do this themselves so that he could have one more opportunity in front of them to speak of Jesus, because that's how Paul operated. And additionally, Paul may have waited to reveal his citizenship because he may have wanted to also demonstrate something to the new believers who made up that young church in Philippi. He demonstrated that he did not rely upon his earthly credentials or citizenship or earthly forms of justice, his earthly rights, as he went through the storms of life. No, Paul demonstrated that he was a citizen of another country, a country without borders, ruled by the king of justice. And Paul had heavenly credentials, and he submitted to God's heavenly form of justice and retribution. In other words, Paul demonstrated that Jesus is Lord of all, and he submitted to the way and the rule of Jesus. And he declined in his declining to claim his citizenship at the beginning of the ordeal, Paul was proving that, that Caesar had nothing to do with this. Caesar was not Lord over him. Paul refused even to use the benefits of the Roman justice system to his advantage. He trusted that Jesus would use whatever means necessary to protect him and use him as he saw fit, even if that meant death. And I think there's so much for us to learn. Don't rely on the government to save you. Don't rely upon your earthly citizenship for protection. Don't, listen, don't insist upon your rights for the sake of fairness. Instead, trust Jesus. Allow him to work on your behalf. And I say that with a caveat, because it's not wrong to claim your rights or use your earthly citizenship for the right reason, okay? Because we're going to see later in Acts that Paul does mention his citizenship early on in the confrontation, all right? Why did he do it then and not now? Because Paul was always looking for a way to share salvation of Jesus with the most people. And he used those rights and those privileges in order to get him in positions to share the gospel. The reason for insisting upon our rights or using our earthly citizenship should be so that we can proclaim Jesus to the greatest number of people possible. You see, not everyone in that Philippi church was going to have the privileges of being a Roman citizen. And so Paul demonstrated that we don't need those privileges and rights in this world in order to live for Jesus. We live for Jesus and we rejoice in him in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in. And years later, from another prison cell, Paul wrote that Philippian church. And I want you to listen uh, to what he was concerned about. Listen to how he was content how he was content, and listen to the words for, of joy and rejoicing. I'm going to read from Philippians again, but this time from the very beginning of the book. Chapter 1, verse 12. He's writing these people. Right? I mean, and, and, and sometimes we take these books and we, we're like, what? you know, he's just writing stuff, but these books have meaning because they are encapsulated in a story. And he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Right? He wants to tell others of Jesus so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he's like, the gospel's going forth because of the bad things that have happened to me. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but they want to they inflict me because I'm in prison, right? What then? He says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. He didn't care about anything else but that the gospel would go forth. 
And then he says, and yes, I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul trusted that all things would work together for good. He rejoiced that the gospel was going forth no matter what. He trusted that in life or death, Jesus was his salvation. What an example to us. Well, the magistrates came, they apologized to Paul and Silas, and then escorted them out of the city. And I just want to read this very last verse. This very last verse. Chapter 16, verse 40. So they went out of the prison and they visited Lydia. Remember Lydia had just received the Lord, right? They visit her. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Before Paul and Silas left entirely, they visited Lydia and they encouraged the brothers. Now, think about that for a second. These two guys had been through the ringer, beaten, humiliated, chained. And even though the family of the jailer had believed and Paul and Silas uh, but Paul and Silas had been through a traumatizing situation. They could have been pretty discouraged and depressed after all that they went through, right? My point is that they could have used encouragement. They could have been the ones to receive from the body. However, Luke mentions that these two were the ones who did the encouraging. These two men did not come to the church with the victim mentality, looking for sympathy and hoping everyone would serve and minister to them. They came to the church with the victor mentality. Look what Jesus has done for us, joyfully offering encouragement and hope to their brothers and sisters. What a great example these two men are. They made nothing of themselves. It was all about loving Jesus and loving others. And so we read this passage all the, the, from last time and this time, and we saw that a seller of purple, a demon-possessed girl, a Roman jailer, people as different as can be, all placed their faith in Jesus. And through belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, they were unified into the church in Philippi. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And I found that Jesus tends to seek those whom we would normally not seek, the despised ones, right? Hiding down by the river, the abused victims of money-hungry slave owners, the rough and callous cynics of society, the, 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 the jailers, and Jesus saves all types from all walks of life. And so no matter what we go through, how much persecution or abuse we are called by God to endure, we have much to be thankful for because Jesus saved each one of us. And we're the ones, we were the ones hiding down by the river, the ones held in bondage to Satan, the cynics of society, but Jesus saved us and brought us together. We're part of his family. We are secure citizens of his kingdom where Jesus is Lord of all and where there's hope and there's a future. And with this knowledge and this faith, let us in all circumstances rejoice together that Jesus alone is our salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. But it is convicting. It goes into our hearts and it's, man, we could never be like Paul and Silas, we think. And yet your Holy Spirit says inside of us that we can do all things through you who gives us strength. So God, I pray that for us, for this, this church, God, that, that you would allow us to be like them, that we would rejoice in all the circumstances in life that are thrown our way. May we take them as a gift from you and an opportunity to present the gospel to more and more people because they need it. God, this world is messed up because it doesn't have Jesus. Lord, you put us here right now in this place, in this church, and in this community so that we could shine the light, so that we could tell others about Jesus. So help us do that. Help us rejoice in the good things that we have because we're so, so blessed by you. Now as we turn to a time of communion, God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts and minister to us as we remember what Jesus did for us. In Jesus' name.
Everybody, thank you again for watching this online service today. We just want to remind you that you can go on our website, kmcc.org, and get in contact with us. We would love to be able to talk with you. You can send us an email. You can give us a call, whatever you'd like to do. We'd love to be in touch with you. Also, you can give online on our website at our homepage. There is a give button right there at the top of the page. Click on that. It'll redirect you to a new page that you can give that way, or you can give through the mail, whatever is best for you. Anyway, we just want to thank you again for joining us this morning, and please tune in next week for our next online service. Have a great week.